what since the second half really how much they've really struggled Mind. set charged with finding some stability from this guy. Um, that I continuously try to manage is um, and it's, it's something that I can control and it is it's not what you know it's what they can understand and yeah and and then that they're not going to be open to understanding until they know that you care so one of the sayings that, that buff sort of got me onto which i've taken on board and it's really helped me in a work sense is they don't care what you know until they know that you care yeah. um and i wasn't always great with that because there was times where i like it's not that i didn't care it was just like i care about the standard right so i don't want you john to do a poor job because that's going to affect peter really badly so i'm really hard on john but the reality of it is that's not actually helping peter <laughs> because like i've got to build this bloke up as best as i can so i've got to connect with him to try and get him you know to know that i care and then try and bring him forward in whatever way that is and sometimes that was lost on me welcome back to the next episode of the journey of a grassroots rugby coach and today, my guest is Cole Mooney. Cole is currently in New Zealand, where he coaches at Pakaranga. But previously, he's coached in Melbourne. He coached at the Gold Coast. He also played ITM Cup, and he played All Island One before retiring due to injuries. During our chat, we spoke about creating relationships with players and how we relate to players, finding a common ground in our coaching, creating good habits during training sessions, increasing the capacity and the consciousness of your players around what you need from them, about being vulnerable and uncomfortable with your players. I really enjoyed my chat with Cole. I did coach with Cole for a year uh, while he was in Melbourne, so it was good to reconnect and finally have a chat, which we've been meaning to do for quite some time. As always, pass this on to anyone that you think can benefit from it. Leave us a rating, give us a thumbs up, but most of all, sit back and enjoy my chat with Cole Mooney. Nobody can't find it. That's a mighty show. A mighty one. Lester. All right, so let's make a start, Cole. Um, so just for the people that won't know who you are, um, who are you, where are you, and what's your involvement in the grassroots game? Uh, so, yeah, Cole Mooney, I'm sort of 40 years old. Uh, I finished playing when I was 28. Um, I played sort of some time in Ireland, uh, not at a not at a super high level. It was all Ireland one, um, and then I played ICM Cup at the time. It was Bunnings Cup now, um, bit of chief sort of development um, before getting into moving over to Queensland. I played some Queensland Cup there. I was playing for what's now Bond Uni, um, but at the time it was the Gold Coast Breakers. Um, then moved into some player coaching, moved to Melbourne. Uh, once in Melbourne, I was sort of played one more year, did an ACL, and sort of that was that was the end of the playing side of things. Um, and then from there, I sort of got stuck right into coaching, uh, right basically right away. So I was doing a Colts team in Melbourne, uh, and then I was really lucky. The first, literally, the first representative team that I had. I had um, was under 16s playing at uh, St Ignatius. I had um, Rob Leoda in the team, <laughs> um, Sione Tupelotu, um, Jordan Uesi, um Josh Cowart. Yeah, um, oh, who else was there? Yeah, there was, a, there, was a, there was a few like really decent players in there, and then there's some. That some that have actually fallen away. I oh, JP Sowney, uh, who ended up being the Waratahs and New Zealand Colts. So like it was a pretty good team. They're probably one of the Sayunga brothers. Um no, no, didn't have um what did I? No, because RJ would have been, but he I think he'd done his done his knee really badly. Yeah. Um, and so he just didn't have that, and then Alex was, was sort of too young, yeah, yeah. and then Freddie was too old. So, yeah. yeah, it was. But that that particular team, and then I was doing that with uh, Greg Coward, um, and then at the time Matt Tank was the head of sort of 
um, pathway and that sort of side of things with, with the Rebels. Um, and then at the same time, I sort of was working in club land um, and I was doing some sort of analysis work um, with the Rebels. It was really laborious stuff, um, but I got access to sort of John Muggleton and um, Ben Darwin and Simon Strawn, who now do game line analytics. Yeah. Um, and Damon Edmonds, who ended up doing sort of with the Wallabies. So I was actually really lucky in hindsight um, to just be involved and have sort of the time to do that. Um, I got to do a full deep code on Verisco, which was <laughs> like hell. So it took me eight hours. I did sort of like a, the equivalent of like a Rebel Rising or um, it was sort of the second tier of the Rebels and did a full deep code on that on Verisco. And that was like eight hours that I'll never get back in my life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and I, was, I think that that was probably pretty formative in terms of the way that I sort of viewed things. Um, and I sort of went from there and said, okay, I did the 16s for one year, um, uh, yeah, one year, and then sort of progressed forward into junior gold, and um, for a couple of years. And then an opening popped up with JC, who I know you've sort of interviewed on here, um, and then did schoolboys with him. Um, and then what that looked like was um, the first year I sort of was involved, we once again had a really good team. We had Hunter Paisami um, and a team, Hinkley, who's playing for Romania in the World Cup. Um, and we did really well. We beat Queensland 1, just lost to New South Wales 2, um, and then there was a couple of little things that went against us to to not get us into the top top four or top two, sorry. Um, and then off the back of that, I was able to get access because of that success into the, the performance program sort of thing. So I'd done my level two um, and then did level three and four off the back of sort of that success. So I was, I was yeah. lucky to be that last group that did their level four and was did the sort of the, the whole year course and, and all that um, with Grippy and um, sort of trucked through on that. And then it was basically powerhouse, um, did some under 19s with Hendo. Um, so it was Brini who does rugby bricks now. <laughs> um, and then it was um, JC was involved and then COVID sort of hit. And then I ended up over here, uh, hit over here being New Zealand. Uh, so I head coached um, Pakaranga last year. Um, and Pakaranga is, the biggest club in New Zealand in terms of player numbers. So there's about 60 teams, um, which is like massive. Um, That's huge, yeah. <laughs> seven full-time uh, sort of staff, including a GM, a director of rugby. Um, and they're constantly, like the Colts team, won it this year. The PDs are always in the final, which is PDs premier development. Um, and... Then this year, I, I sort of did the D um, and director of rugby, Grant Henson. Um, Buff was um, the head coach and sort of trucked through. And we went from eighth last year and then we finished fifth this year. A uh, couple of couple of um, games that we could have done a little bit better in. Um, but yeah, it was, it was it was a sort of, it's been quite a big sort of change, I think, for the club culturally and, and sort of a number of different ways. And um yeah, when you're dealing with a big beast like Pakaranga, um, it's certainly different to dealing with powerhouse. Yeah. Yeah, just the sheer weight of numbers would be, um, yeah, pretty pretty hard to get my head around that, that many, that that sort of numbers when you're coaching, when you're coaching Melbourne where you've got, you know, a couple of grades and some junior teams and, yeah, no, that's, that's a big step. That's, uh, that's thanks, mate. That's really good. Um so over that journey um, that you've been coaching, whether it's, you know, junior level or senior level, what's <clears throat> one of the hardships or lessons that you've learned um, over the time? And the reason I ask this of, of all the coaches that come on, because we've all had, you know, a shit outcome, shit happens, something bad. Like we've, we've had all those trials as we go through and a lot of coaches just go, no, nah, that's it. I'm not good enough. I'm crap. And they throw their toys out the cot and they walk away. But the good coaches actually sit back and reflect on that and learn from it and 
you know, how do we improve the team? How do I improve myself? How do I get better from that disappointment that's just happened? Yeah. So it's, it's sort of your question, how have I improved or what have I taken away? Or Yeah, so what well, what was the disappointment and what did you take away from it that that younger coaches could look back and, you know, potentially go, oh, something similar like that's happened to me um, or, you know, just because just we all have shit happen in our coaching journey. Yeah, um, yeah I think, you know, I mean, look, this is sort of woven – into and out of um, my coaching a fair bit and actually moving country, it sort of brought it back again, which is a bit of a painful sort of thing. Um, I think there was a time where, um, so when you're dealing with younger players, you tend to be, it tends to be more coach focused because they just don't, they're just not at the point where the decision-making, everything is just not quite there. So quite directed. Um, And so transitioning from, sort of those junior gold rep teams. So they're trying to be performance players or a version of, and they actually do what they're told largely. They're they're used to school teachers telling them what to do and and being guided. And then you transition into prems and it's like, okay, well, that's that's fine. (laughs) Um, And you're dealing with men who have their own opinions and their own egos and thought processes. Um, And so I suppose the hardest thing for me uh, and then I had the same here, right? Because I came from an Australian demographic and dealing with people. And in some ways, you can be, it is different. Like there is some, there are some differences um, and sort of adjusting to that. But I think the biggest thing that I've learned um, that I continuously try to manage is, um, and it is, it's something that I can control, and it is, it's not what you know it's what they can understand and yeah and and then that they're not going to be open to understanding until they know that you care so one of the sayings that that buff sort of got me onto which i've taken on board and it's really helped me in a work sense is they don't care what you know until they know that you care um and i wasn't always great with that because there was times where i like it's not that i didn't care it was just like i care about the standard Right, so I don't want you, John, to do a poor job because that's going to affect Peter really badly. So I'm really hard on John, but the reality of it is that's not actually helping Peter because, like, I've got to build this bloke up as best as I can. So I've got to connect with him to try and get him, you know, to know that I care and then try and bring him forward in whatever way that is. And sometimes that was lost on me. Um, And I get to a position where it's like, okay, He's the issue, not me. But I actually can't control him. All I can control is the way that I'm reacting and what I'm trying to pull out of the player and trying to find a sort of common ground and and things like that. And I haven't always been good at that. And it's sort of a, a constant struggle. And then I think with any with any relationship, any player or any coach that I've sort of ever dealt with, I'm so much better now. Like I used to be able to only relate to say 20% of players and coaches um and I, and I think that percentages is growing all the time and i had a, a really unique experience for me this year um in terms of i've got um a work team that i deal with and it's um i think it's 16 females and, and sort of a, a gay a gay guy and so i drive after dealing with them Okay, and sort of a lot of alpha females and strong businesswomen and, and pretty cool to deal with. I drive basically an hour or two hours, depending on traffic, uh, to training. And then I'm dealing with guys that want to smash each other and Pacific Island. And so that ability to relate was, I couldn't have been further apart yeah. in terms of the starting point. Um, so I suppose the learning for me was they're not the issue, I'm the issue. <laughs> um, and then once you sort of take the ego out of it and go, okay, well, let me let me start from bottom up. Okay, what what common ground can I find? And Cole, are you being a dick? <laughs> and if you are, own it and then just acknowledge and then just try and find common ground. Like I, yeah, that that's probably the key thing that I I think that has really helped me when I've whenever I've had issues from a performance perspective, it's always gone back to what has the player not picked up or what and why haven't they picked it up and it's always been because we haven't just we just haven't connected properly 
Yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's a good point, mate, around those connection to, to players and, yeah, finding your, finding your tribe of players and all that type of stuff. No, that's really good, mate. Um, so, and I, and I don't know how your your club, how you run training sessions at, at your club, but a lot of the coaches I've been talking to, they'll do like first, second grade, third, fourth, like they split the grades up and then some put them all together. Um but what would a session look like um, with you when you've – and if you've got, you know, potentially, you know, a Rob Leota in, that, in, the, in the group and a guy that's only ever going to be a fourth grader, um, but he just wants to play with his mates, but he's probably going to be the club president or the major sponsor, but he's just a good rugby person, and you've got to develop both of them so they can be the best version of themselves, but you've got, you know, a potential elite player who's got the skills up here and you've got this other guy, you know, that couldn't catch a cold in the middle of winter. So we've got to develop him without one of them going, oh, this is crap, I'm, I'm out of here, see you later. Because yeah. it's it's a huge uh, it's a huge issue for coaches, I think, um, at the grassroots level when you've got that big skill gap between teams. Yeah. So in Pukaranga, we don't have that massive skill gap necessarily. Yep. Um, like when a super player drops down, like we've had, we had Tavita Mafaleo drop down last year. Um, we've got guys that are sort of on the verge of Auckland and we've got guys that are sort of approaching under-19s and stuff. So the gap isn't that disparate. Yeah. Like, yes, it's disparate, but it's probably more in like physical preparedness and a little bit of mental acuity. Um, but it's not like it is in Melbourne. Um, so I think, like, I absolutely understand what you're saying, though, because I had um, two guys I was coaching with have both coached ITM Cup and been involved at, a, at the sort of the top level. They've, they've literally coached against the All Blacks. Yeah. So, um, but Glenn is, Glenn's a bit different, and, and he's really good in that space as well, but... I think you've got to have an understanding of what the problem statement is. And the problem statement is you've got high performance, high achievers on one side, and then you've got low performance sort of not performing at the level, but they're wanting different experiences. So one's wanting a high performance experience. One's wanting a social experience. Yeah. Yeah. And it's oil and water. Like they're not going to get the same shit out of the same session. Yeah. Um, and so like, I think the way that that, works within a session as we do a lot of game-based sort of stuff yeah. anyway um and the good players tend to be good at it and the bad players tend to not be as good at it but they learn and, and so the whole the whole tide sort of lifts and when you get into things closed environment skill work you know line out scrum things like that then the coach that's your opportunity to really um intervene and sort of really lift that player up yeah um so how I would do it should I be doing it. So Tavita Mafaleo, there's no point putting him against a guy that's just come up from second grade. Yeah. Okay. So the best way to do it is I'd, I'd probably leverage him as a resource and go, hey, mate, can you actually help here from a coaching perspective? And like, just just take an eye. I'll, I'll, I'll run everything. But like, if you can invest in him, I think he's going to really grow. And, and so then he becomes invested in that guy's success. And so then you've got your top performer versus your bottom performer and Hopefully that gap starts to close. This guy's got his chest puffed out because all of a sudden the super player's taking an interest in him and the other guy's quite humbled to share his knowledge. And we all know the last step of, of learning is teaching, so he's yeah. going to get something out of it well, as well. Um, then I think if you let the social guys lead the social piece and the high performers guide the high performer piece, um, I don't think that that's, that's necessarily a bad thing I think JF used to do it really well. Um, and he actually sort of, in a change room setting, I saw him do it in, at school level. Okay, guys, we're in amber now, so there's a really clear understanding of the state that the change room was in. Yeah. So green, you can do whatever you want. Red, we're getting really intense. We're pre-game. And so that's where you run into, into issues where that experience of social versus high performance can, yeah. can be a bit of an issue. But when it's social time, it's social guys do that. Let them, hey, can you own this part of, our culture and then high performers hey can you lead this so we had that this year where 
um, our leaders would come up for a, with a theme for the week and they'd deliver the theme on behalf of the boys to the group. Um, and then on the social side of things, the team needed to do a social night and so we left that to the more social guys to organise because they both of them were probably not super interested in each other's part in that. Yeah. So it, it kind of works out well. You just, but I think that is the problem statement. But then for as a coach, so you've got two ends of it. It's kind of kind of like the Republicans and the Democrats, and all you're fighting for is Ohio, which is the swing state. <laughs> so if you have a few wins, okay, you can swing it towards performance because all of a sudden there's something to invest in because there's a championship on the go, okay? But if you have a few losses, you got to be really wary that it can swing to social because that is still on the table all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the social's always on the table, mate. Yeah. So there's no point in trying to convince the social guys. You're only fighting for the for the middle of the bell curve. The social guys are always going to be social. High performance are always going to be high performance. Just try and try and solve the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes that makes some sense. Now that's good. And like, I know I've been at clubs, and and you probably have been too. Where you may be the only coach there, and and you and you're just trying to make things work. So. I'll, I mean, we all know <laughs> we all know players. Like I could give you an example of a player, um, Blano. He is probably that, but yeah. he can swing either way. Yeah. So he is literally the swing state. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And every club's got one. I reckon every club's got one. So right? that's that's embodied in one player, but there's a whole lot of his mates on both sides. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that that's really good, mate. Um, yeah, and if we can identify who those swing players are, um, and push them to which way we want to, we want we want it to go is often a lot easier than trying to to fight against them. Yeah, word powerhouse, I actually stratified it out. So, yeah. like, I actually did a depth chart, and when I did it, I said, okay, here's the tenure. This is the type of player they are. So this is at age level. This is where they look at. Um, from a positional standpoint, this is their upside, this is their downside. And I actually was able to map out pretty accurately where the guys were at um, and sort of where their aspirations were. And then if you just do that and stratify it out, it, 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 you'll have five names on a list. It's like, okay, I need to stay on them. Because yeah. if I add those five to those 10 high performers, then I've got 15. And there was a saying from a... Um, I think it was a Canadian volleyball coach. And he said, you can only ever have one and a half idiots on an island. Um, because if you have two, then there's two of them going, hey, come and join us on Idiot Island. <laughs> so it's about controlling sort of that middle ground. Yeah. <laughs> now that's some that's some good uh that's some good uh thought process there, mate. I, I like that. Um nice. So you were saying that a lot of your stuff, a lot of your training sessions are a game that game-based stuff, which is um, the, the way everything's getting coached these days. So during a session where you've got your game-based stuff happening, um, how do you look at your feedback to the players in session? Because, and I know, you know, everyone likes feedback differently and there's all different types that do it. But if you're running a session where they're, you know, you've got the game happening, do you stop the game? Do you get, you know, more than one coach involved and you know one one coach is giving feedback to to maybe the attack and one guy's doing it for the defense or how does that in in game at training stuff look like around the feedback? So if I'm if I'm doing sort of a, some D stuff, like we probably didn't get it quite right in terms of the D stuff. Yeah. Um because I would run the drill and kind of coach on the run. Um but then Buff would come in and then you'd do feedback and we'd quickly stop water switch around yeah. and my stuff was quite fatiguing so it was kind of like there wasn't really much point in like the guys are screwed by the end of big chunks of it but that was my stuff but every literally every training and every warm-up um pre-game we did what was called habit game and so it started with one habit and so it might be um double movement on ground for ball place or score the try yeah. you know and then you would build the habits in. So one of them was catching outside body. So early grab on ball, finishing hands to target, um, 
race to brace or race to space for clean. Um, we actually did like a good tackle one where it was um, like around low chops. So you'd make the touch and then go down. So we'd put these habits in and we'd just layer it on. It was like a CD stacker. Yeah. And it wasn't about scoring tries. It wasn't about um, points in terms of scoring touchdowns or anything like that. It was about retaining position and continuing to play. And the feedback was given via, you didn't do this, turnover. Yeah. So it, it was it was really evident. Um, and you'd go massive passages of play by the end of the season where, where the boys would do the habit game really well. It's like, nah, didn't have two cleaners, turnover. But we'd have two coaches working that across the field. Uh, and if we had to split the group up, we'd split the group up. We'd often, I would say, for the second half of the year, I reckon 50% of the time we'd have a local school come in and train with us. Yeah. So we had um, Sacred Heart College come in, who won Auckland 1A. Uh, we had Howard come in. We had Pakaranga come in. Um, we had Botany Downs come in because they were in our local sort of community catchment area and they'd come in and train with us on a on a Thursday night or a Tuesday night, whatever sort of worked. And so we'd often have these massive swirling games. We'd have to split the field up and they wouldn't know what they were doing. So once again, it put pressure on our boys to coach them on the run because they wanted to win the habit game. Yeah. Um, and habit game is heaps better than doing fitness. So yeah, boys are good. But yeah, that's what we called it. We just called it a habit game and it was really obvious you know, a turnover represented a failure in doing the correct habit. Um, and, and it really impacted our game in terms of what we wanted to do. And, and the, I think just the cleanliness around our breakdown and our and our role clarity and sort of what we're trying to do and that type of thing. Um, and then also, I think it's it was a good game from the perspective of guys are so obsessed with playing in shape. And this is almost movement away from that so now just play on top of them once we line break okay we're just brawling we're short ball we're playing on top of them we're feeding through that same hole support that type of thing and so i think that that was that was probably the most important thing um in terms of the, the feedback was just given via turnover yeah yeah and i think i think like you said that that there's that consequence of that's what happens on the weekend if we yeah. don't execute this and um, you know we're not we're not singling people out. We're just turning the ball over because if you turn it over on the weekend, we're now you know defending counter attack or or whatever whatever that habit or that skill is that that we're trying to to execute. Now that I potentially have seen it most brutally done, and and the guys done it this whole career, but the Miami Dolphins versus the Patriots yesterday. So this guy Pop Douglas uh, turned the ball over. Because he got run down from the back, so he's from a small college. He's just not used to it. He's really electric, and um, got chased down. Ball got knocked out. Didn't play a single snap after that. Yeah, <laughs> like, like the the biggest, the key skill is retention of ball first and foremost. Yeah, sort of thing in in that game, and so that's the consequence that is done at an NFL level. It's like, hey, you're probably our most electric player. If you can't hold the ball, you know, used to us, you don't play anymore. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that, and it's instant as well. It's that instant feedback that we're not we're not doing this what what we uh, what we need to do. Uh, that, that's good, mate. Thank you for that. Um, coach development. What do you do around coach development? Um, like we've got all the coach education stuff that we do, like the level one, level two, level three, level four stuff, which is all important and is is that sort of base level stuff, but. If that's all you ever do, you're never going to be a good coach, in my opinion. Like, there's, you've got to continue to improve yourself as, you know, even as a, you know, level three, level four coach. If you're not developing away from those classroom sessions, you're probably not going to go too far. Yeah. Um, so it's it's funny actually because I think like the first thing you sort of want to do is you you when you start out as a as a coach and and I. You know, you want to learn drills and what needs to go on. And this, the funniest thing that, so in the last year, right, right I've got um, I've got an exec coach that, you know, I, I work with. 
So that's around sort of work and, and craft is sort of the category I put that in. It's the craft that I get paid for. Um, and then I've also got like another sort of performance coach who's got massive acumen, right? He's trained Olympic athletes. He's trained in the military. Anything from like diet to massage to chakra to sales techniques to the whole lot. Like he's just complete growth mentality. And I actually think that those two probably have added to my coaching and augmented like my knowledge so much more. Like, and so when I look at where my focus lies now, like, yes, I read books all the time. Um, like, yes, I'm listening to podcasts all the time. Like I, I'm always trying to pick up different things. Like I was listening to an Ian Foster one yesterday and then I went straight from listening to that to like a political one. Um, and then I looked at, just because I knew I was having this conversation, I looked at sort of what the books are that are around me at the moment. I've got, I've got a book by Marcus Aurelius um, called Meditations. I've got, I've actually got a book on um, sort of romance, which was written by like a New York novelist. And it was, but it's more like a study. Um, I've got LeBron's book. I've got another one that's like a stoic reading. Um, and so those are the, sort of the books that I've got around me at the moment um so i still do that but what i try to work on at the moment is increasing capacity so um you you probably alluded to it before um we don't have a whole lot of time so like what can you do with that time so i want to increase my capacity which means reducing the time i spend on other things or incre increasing my ability on the things that I am working on um, in different ways to do that. And then the second part is increase of consciousness. So as, you're in, as my consciousness goes up in terms of better understanding of how people work, um, emotional intelligence and things like that, it makes me much more effective in dealing with people, which makes me quicker at dealing with people, which once again means I can deal with more people. So that's completely outside of anything coaching-wise but it allows me to have much more effective communication and, and conversations. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and there's a few coaches I've spoken to and a lot of the stuff they do around development is away from, you know, rugby or coaching, but it's just, like you said, just giving you extra skills that you can then layer into to what you're doing. Um, but good, I man. think part of it as well comes from, <clears throat> like, when you see a coach at super level, at all black level, or whatever it is, you straight away go, hey, on the, I can use that or that's relevant or that's not relevant. Yeah. And I just find now so much of it going, hey, that's the thought process behind that's great, but that's not how I'm going to deliver it. Yeah. And that's not who I am. And so it's, it's not, so yes, I can understand that, but this is how it works yeah. for me. And having a better understanding of that falls into that consciousness sort of piece. Okay, and then how do you do, deliver it effectively falls into sort of the capacity piece. Yeah, and I think too we, um, <clears throat> like you said, we see other coaches at whatever level it is and you see them run a drill or, you know, a backline move or whatever. And as young coaches, you go, yeah, I'm going to do that on Tuesday night at training and you get there and it just doesn't work because, A, you might not have the cattle or, you know, it's too it's too advanced for them. But if you can actually look at that and go, like you said, I understand the thought process, but I can't deliver it like that to my boys. I've actually got to change this, this, and this, or I've got to regress it to this skill level to get my boys to do to do that. I think the more we can look at those. Um... I, I'm actually a step further. I'm like, rather than can't do it for these guys this way, it's like I won't do it this way. Yeah. Because that's not me. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So it's like I refuse, like I can see what you're doing there defensively, and I like that, but I am not doing it that way because not only is that not me, it's not going to come across as genuine. It's not going to be the most effective way. So the most effective way is my way, which then I have to try and figure that out. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good, mate. I like that. Um yeah, like you could put, you know, you could put five, six, ten defensive coaches together and they're all going to have a different system, a different way of doing stuff. Um, 
you know, yeah, I agree with you, but I'm not going to do that. And I think they're conversations that we need to be open to as well. And mm-hmm. you know, we don't have to always agree with every coach that we talk to, but understand their thought process or what they're trying to achieve. But you just, you know, like you said, Dan, I'm not doing it. I understand what you're trying to do and I appreciate what you're trying to do, but that's a hey, not not me. It's not my my team's not like that or for whatever reason. But you you take that little bit of you know, a little bit of gold away from everyone you speak to um, and develop it your own way. Yeah. I think as a like as I've progressed coaching and playing mm. wise, life wise, it one of the sayings that comes out to me was you know, be open to everything and attach to nothing. Yeah. And nobody can do that, right? <laughs> you, no, you can't. Not at all. Like a, we're, we're just, we're not the Dalai Lama, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got our own egos and biases and stuff like that. But I like to think that I'm a much better soul for going, you know, okay, where does that sit? I'm seeking to understand before seeking to be understood. Like I'm, I'm so much better than that than I was five years ago. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, the more the more we progress in our journey, the more whatever that skill is that you've got, it develops and you're more open to have those discussions with people. And, you know, I know when I was, you know, a, a young coach was like, oh, I'm not going to talk to that bloke because you'll think I'm a dickhead, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. But now it's what you said, yep, I can understand that. I can do that, but I'm still going to do it my way. Um and we're just more confident, I think, as we talk to other coaches as as we get more experience. Yeah, I think I, I'd agree with that. But it's it's that's it's strange because you're more confident being uncomfortable. I think is the other part. Yeah, yeah. which and, means being vulnerable. Yeah, so. and and the more that you, I don't know about you, but the more that I know about the game, the more I realise I don't know about the game. Yeah, one of the best sayings of I've, I've heard as well was. Uh, as the island of your knowledge grows, so too does the shoreline of your ignorance. Oh, yeah. So, like that—that that one's quite a big one for me. The more I know, the more I don't. I know I don't know. Yeah. So. And I, and I think too the the point you made there is you're not afraid to be vulnerable and go, hey, look, I don't, I don't know, but let me go and find out for you. Well, let's mm-hmm. go and work. You know, because um, you know we go back to some of the stuff we talked about before. We've got the trust from the players, all those connections with the players. We're, we're genuine when we go, mate, I, I don't know, but let's go and work. Let's go and, you know, but I know someone that will have, know the answer to that or let's work through it together and, yeah, it just helps build everything. That's really Yeah, cool. I mean, some of the stuff I was doing defensively this year or trying to in the preseason, I was like, it was an absolute, it was, it was some of the worst coaching I've ever done. Mm. Like, it was the most challenging, but it was probably the worst. Yeah. Because I was like, this is just, this is not what this should look like. Yeah, and I and I, I was like, this is great because it's challenging, but this is this is all, if it keeps going like this, based on trend, we're looking at a shit show here. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, so did it come good in the end, mate, or did you change your defensive pattern? Uh, we altered a couple of things, but the principles yeah. stayed the same. Uh, we had the best day in the comp. Yeah, so and like. And statistically think, yeah and i think too that comes with that experience of this is what we want to achieve um at the moment yeah it looks like a shit show so what do i tweak to make it work i don't need to knock it down and rebuild it i might just need to replace a few things or tweak a few things um and that comes back to that being genuine and you know doing all that stuff so i think as well there was we had some new players as well yeah. like each year yeah. you get new players and it's kind of like those players can bring their own weapons to the table and their own strengths. Yep. And that kind of, to be honest, we had two or three guys that were just like, they completely changed the way that we're able to to defend this year versus last year. Um, and we didn't know those players were going to be there when we came up with the initial, like, this is what we're going to have a crack at. So, yeah. And it changed the way we were able to do stuff. And we didn't need to be as drilled in this. We could be a bit flexible here, give the guys some leeway here. And we know these two guys are going to solve for that. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's good, mate. That's really good. Um, So think back to that first year that you were coaching, um, even as a player coach, 
what advice would you give yourself if you could go back in time to that that first year of coaching, uh, knowing what you know now? Yeah, okay. Um, I think, the, well, the first one that I've already mentioned, they don't care what you know until they know that yeah. you care. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing would be coach, and and the definition of the words is quite important, but coach the skill, not the drill. Yeah. Um, and so that's not – so skill is under time and space pressure and execution of a habit. Um, and that's my definition of it. Um, and then – and so that means you don't really want to collect – drills you want to go what's the skill outcome you want and then sort of devolve from there but also you've got to have a starting point right you can't yeah, yeah. think like that straight away so I, I get that um i think the third thing that i would recommend that i actually did quite well and i was really fortunate with i went to a graduation once and it was just before um like a financial crisis yeah and they brought in this business lecturer and he was sort of talking away and um they sort of said, oh, what what advice do you have for the graduates? And he sort of went through three or four things. But one of the things that he he said was cuddle up to the grey hairs. And what he meant by that is talk to the senior people in whatever organisation you go into because we're about to go through some chaos financially here and they've seen it before. Yeah. And, and I just don't – I think with courses – I think with curriculums, I think with everything that's online, with YouTube, I think with um, Facebook, um, Instagram, all of that, what we're not doing is talking to the old blokes that have done it before. And and it's not about talking to every old bloke. It's about talking to the ones that have had that unique bit of success in that unique area for a period of time. Because a lot of the stuff that was happening way back is coming back. An example of that, um, counties Manukau, back in the 1970s, they used to put a number eight right out in the back line and have him shoot up from outside in. Okay, it was basically the first, one of the first versions of a rush defence. Yeah. So now that's happening everywhere. Yeah. Um, and I look at, there's a book by Bill Walsh, which Eddie Jones reckons is like the book. Um, I, can't, I can't actually remember the name of it. I lent it to a bloke in Melbourne, actually, and I'd like to get it back. Um, and you can't get it. It's in print by Bill Walsh. And he he literally, it's, it's this thick, all of the super rugby franchises in New Zealand. And it goes down to what to do after um, a big loss, what to do after a big win. It's just by bullet point. This is what you need to address with the team. And it's all that empirical knowledge is out there, but we're not looking in books. We're not talking to old blokes at the rugby club. We just we're looking at the new shiny baubles on Instagram and this and that, and I just think that the base of the pyramid is still those big conversations with with guys with grey hair, yeah. and I just and I just don't think we're doing enough of that, and we're we're sort of looking at the the new shiny attack thing, the new shiny D concepts, and the, all they are is deriv derivatives of the stuff that's come before. Yeah, because we haven't really created anything new in the last twenty years. Yeah, I think it's just, it's improved over time and just different assignments and mm. things like that. And you have to adjust to rule changes and that. But I think the people management piece is also there. Like I've been lucky. I, I had a, a mentor from when I was 13, right? Like I met him when I was 13 and played like touch rugby with him. He was an ex stealer Mary All Black. He played rugby league a whole lot. And he was my mentor when I was playing Counties Manukau and coming through Academy. When I moved to Queensland, he was a coach of mine and went through. I went down, stayed with him down in, down in the Mount um, a few weeks ago, and it's just great talking to him. Yeah. And then I was really lucky because I coached seven-odd teams with Ellis Meachin as well. Yeah. It's like there's – and the grounding that I had there in terms of just an understanding of – root cause analysis, key factor analysis of why a skill's going wrong, why the team is not going in the direction it needs to, when to prod it something, when to pull back from it. I didn't always get it right because I just didn't quite have the 
the mechanism for for judgment yet. Um, but like it's let, but I reckon it honestly, I reckon it let forward. I reckon it took years of years off like of my learning that I needed to get just by talking to blokes that had been there, done it, um, rather than just going to I don't know a rugby course and listen to a guy who's twenty three give you a syllabus. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right, and I think too, like the learnings that you get from even when they have those set courses or seminars, it's it's the beers afterwards when you you know like you're talking to the older coaches or you know you can actually then pick your audience as well and just not necessarily like you said listen to that that young do give you a, a half an hour spiel on something but pick pick the guys you want to talk to and have a chat to them over a beer and um because they all like talking they all like talking about themselves and stuff you know we all do we all like talking about our own things and stuff like that so you yeah, know that's really good mate that's um I'll, I'll cuddle up to the gray i'll have to remember that one mate. I'll, I'll like that um mate this has been awesome um I know you're pretty busy at the moment, so I will let you go. Um, been great chatting to you again, mate. And um, good, we'll be in touch. Yeah, sounds awesome. awesome. And um, yeah, I sort of really appreciate what you're doing here, Bully. As I said, I think there's there is a gap, okay, and it's really hard to bridge from sort of grassroots and the challenges that you that you have dealt with, that I am dealing with, that we're all dealing with, and the step between there and wherever we're going. So I think this is a really important vehicle. So, yeah, um, heads up and well done to you. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, cool. All right. Thanks, mate. Yeah, appreciate it, Polly. Well done, mate. And the moves off their own ball. That is monstrous. It's being held at the back by the foot of Ben Morgan. Kept it in England. Marching it on. Were they going to pass it? Still there. There is the penalty. Try right, that was extra.